Do you want to see a really cool rock? These strata of metamorphic and sedimentary rocks are located on Teljero Beach in Portugal. Do you see what makes them so unusual? Take a closer look for a moment. Don't the strata in the lower part of the image seem odd to you? Notice how there is an abrupt change in the layers going from the bottom to the top of the photograph. The strata in the top are pretty much horizontal, but below them, the strata are practically vertical. This boundary is an erosional surface, and it is a spectacular example of an unconformity. An unconformity is a buried erosional or non-depositional surface between strata of different ages. But what does this mean? How do unconformities form? And are there different types? To begin to answer these questions, let's review erosional surfaces. Erosional surfaces are surfaces produced by the removal of rock or sediment. They were produced in the past by weathering and erosion. Rocks exposed on the surface of our planet are constantly being broken down into smaller pieces through the process of weathering and transported from their place of origin by the process of erosion. The agents of erosion are gravity, wind, running water, and ice. This image shows you the sequence of events leading to the formation of an erosional surface. Let's walk through it together. At time one, there is deposition of strata, layers A, B, and C. These layers are deposited underwater through sedimentation in the ocean. During time two, these layers are uplifted. The strata rise above sea level, so they are no longer located underwater. Because they are above sea level now, there is no more deposition or sedimentation. They are exposed to the elements, gravity, wind, running water, and ice. During time three, these agents cause weathering and erosion of rock. Stratum C is completely destroyed, and so is part of stratum B. Stratum B becomes truncated. Finally, during time four, the strata are subsided. The layers sink back beneath the ocean and there is new deposition and sedimentation. Because stratum C was completely destroyed, the new sediment, stratum D, is deposited directly on top of what's left of layer B. We call the contact boundary between stratum B and stratum D an erosional surface, as it records when and where the layers were exposed above water and rock layers like stra stratum C were destroyed. Another way of thinking about the erosional surface is that it represents missing rock, rock corresponding to time that we can't study. Erosional surfaces form during periods of time when there is no deposition of sediment. Not to mention, the strata beneath them tend to be missing and truncated. Rock layers are missing. You aren't seeing the entire history of deposition and sedimentation. Erosional surfaces are generally illustrated in geologic sections as wavy, irregular, undulating lines. Often enough, you will see abrupt changes in lithology across lines of erosion, as well as the termination of fault lines and intrusive rocks. In this example, notice how the intrusive rock R was eroded away along with the sedimentary rock layer X. Once sedimentation resumed, the new rock B formed on top of both R and X. We call this a cross-cutting relationship. 
We can identify erosional surfaces in the field by carefully studying the contacts between rocks. Geologists can identify ancient erosional surfaces from a variety of observation, including the presence of small cave and karst-like structures which form through dissolution of rock. They can also recognize lithological and mineralogical patterns that evolve due to the exposure of rock to the chemical reactions involved in weathering. Sedimentary structures and trace fossils produced by plant roots can also help you to identify erosional surfaces. When surfaces are exposed and experiencing erosion, they may be overgrown by plants. Plants will grow on the rock or sediment, further promoting weathering and erosion. In the process, they produce sedimentary structures called root traces. When the rock or sediment is later buried, these root traces may remain, marking the location of the erosional surface. Of course, unconformities can also help you to identify erosional surfaces. At unconformities, rocks do not conform with each other across the line of erosion. The line may mark a significant change in the lithology of rock. For example, there may be igneous rock below the erosional surface and sedimentary rock above it. Alternatively, the erosional surface may mark a big change in the orientations of the strata, like the erosional surface at Tejero Beach in Portugal. There are actually four types of unconformities. I find that the best way to learn about unconformities is to learn how to distinguish these four types. The erosional surface at Telhero Beach marks an angular unconformity. Angular unconformities are easy to recognize. At angular unconformities, horizontal strata lie on top of tilted and eroded beds. In these cases, the lower strata were first tilted as a result of plate tectonics and then truncated by erosion before the upper strata were laid down above and parallel to the erosional surface. Let's take a moment and walk through this process step by step. The principle of original horizontality tells us that all strata are laid down in horizontal layers. And the principle of superposition tells us that the oldest layers occur near the bottom. So strata are laid down in order. One, after another, after another, and so on, and so on. Sooner or later, however, sedimentation may stop. No more layers may be deposited for quite some time. During this hiatus in sedimentation, Tectonic forces on our planet may fold, distort, or simply tilt the layers. Like all other rocks on the surface of our planet, these tilted strata are subject to weathering and erosion. The processes would destroy and truncate the rocks, producing an erosional surface. Eventually, sedimentation would resume at this location and sediment will be deposited on top of the erosional surface above the truncated layers. Again, the layers are laid down, one after another, after another, and so forth. Overall, this is the natural process that produces an angular unconformity. It's a long process. It can take tens or hundreds of millions of years or longer. Another type of unconformity is called a nonconformity. Nonconformities are generally easy to identify if you can recognize the differences between igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks. At nonconformities, 
sedimentary rock layers occur on an erosional surface located at the top of much older igneous or metamorphic rock. How do you know that there is an erosional surface here? Igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks form through very different processes and under very different circumstances. There must have been enough time for erosion as well as a change in conditions between these rocks being formed. Disconformities are harder to identify. In these cases, sedimentary rocks occur on both sides of the erosional surfaces. The best way to recognize a disconformity is to attempt to identify the erosional surface. This erosional surface truncates the lower sedimentary strata, and it is usually quite irregular. It may contain cave or karst-like structures, root traces, and other signs of weathering and erosion. Of all the types of unconformities, however, paraconformities are the hardest to see and recognize. Like disconformities, paraconformities consist entirely of sedimentary rock. However, instead of an erosional surface, there is only a surface of non-deposition. There is no evidence of weathering or erosion. The sedimentary strata on opposite sides of the surface seem to be conformable. There is no obvious evidence of missing rock. The boundary is regular. You usually need the absolute ages of the strata or fossil evidence to show that there is missing time or missing rock in your sequence. Learning to recognize and distinguish unconformities are important steps in becoming a historical geologist. With this knowledge, you can begin to look at geologic cross sections and determine the sequence of events that led to the structures you find. We call this process relative dating. It is the science of determining the relative order of past events, such as deposition, erosion, intrusion, and faulting. It is the key to traveling backward through time, through Earth history.